Welcome aboard, everybody. I'm with my fantastic mate, Matty Woolers. Matty and I flew together about 17, 18, 19 years ago for Thompson on a 767. Matty was the captain when I was in, in we were in Indonesia for two months on the Hajj project, flying from Ujum Pandang up through Indonesia up to Jeddah. We had the most fantastic time apart from on the flight deck. Our social ah. life was just completely abundant. We used to explore everywhere in Indonesia and it was just a wonderful, wonderful time. Now for me, Matty is one of those wonderful, wonderful natural leaders who is just so self-aware, does so much to work on his inner peace, inner harmony. And we're going to talk about that today, how that benefits him and everybody else around it in terms of mindfulness and confidence. But Matty, let's just hear a little bit about your couple of minutes, just pr uh, how you got into into flying, a little bit of a bio. Welcome, Matty. Thank you, Ben. You are very, very kind, kind words. Well, I started flying in 1991. I was still at boarding school and I joined a local flying club, a local gliding club. And Unfortunately, I never soloed, but um, eventually I, I picked up uh, flying in 92 while living in Germany. Uh, I started flying with Lufthansa and we went off to Arizona, came back, finished the training in, uh, in Germany. Fortunately, during the very dark times in 92 when there were hardly any flying jobs around. I got a job with a nice uh, corporate company called uh, Bart Uza based in Denmark on a, a beach. Uh, it wasn't, yeah, the beach um, Cheyenne 3 Alpha. Mm. And four months later, I was offered my jet job on uh, the MD-80, the company called Aeroloid. I stayed with them for a good three years, and in '98, had the great opportunity to join Britannia, Britannia Airways. That was fantastic. I stayed with Britannia. That's where we met Ben. Yeah. Uh, later, we were group brand at Thompson. Uh, in 2009, I left for New Zealand. I'm half Kiwi, so I had a fantastic time flying around New Zealand, South Pacific, and across to Australia. And in 2010, I joined Emirates. I've just come back from the UAE after spending 30 and a half years with Emirates, flying around the globe, everywhere except Antarctica. I really enjoyed flying the Triple. It's a lovely aircraft. It's a beautiful, beautiful um, machine. Uh, the people there are very nice. You face different challenges in every flight. You have people from multiple backgrounds, cultures, and uh, the network itself is quite interesting. So talking about leadership, Ben, yeah. I have a small example that happened not so long ago on a flight from Harare to Lusaka, um, where the Weather forecast for Lusaka was lacking. Apparently, it was all nice. Fortunately, I had an experienced first officer, Italian, and a very experienced support captain, an augmenting captain. And when we got to Lusaka, there was a massive, massive uh, thunderstorm over the field. There were five big thunderstorms. And uh, eventually we we held. I was the pilot flying uh, because the first officer had flown all the way from Dubai via Lusaka to Harare. We decided I'd fly it back. Simply as that. So we flew on approach, and needless to say, at a very low altitude. And I wrote the our safety report. It was a state of three hundred feet, but it was actually. 39 feet. I went around. I, I saw some blurred runway lights where there was so much water on the windshield and wow. the runway. Uh, the windshield wipers were hardly clearing them. Water. 
I, I was not happy with it. And uh, fortunately enough, uh, all of us agreed. And uh, later on, they agreed with me. So that was a good decision to do. I, I We went around <laughs> right through some heavy rain, out of the rain and held somewhere. And then uh, what happened next was quite interesting, Ben, because to me, it's, it's normal. Uh, you use all the resources you have at the time. So I had a fantastic first officer uh, with a good head on his shoulders. So I gave him the task of flying. No, you, you fly the aircraft. And I was liaising then with uh, the other captain. So what do you think? What, what can we do? What do you reckon? In the meantime, um, the first officer, I told you this story already, he was flying around the airfield like a hungry fox trying to get into the hen house, <laughs> looking <laughs> for opportunity to, to, to get the aeroplane in now, unfortunately. Uh, we checked both runways, unfortunately. Um, uh, it took some time. And the beautiful thing about having a good crew is, Ben, is let people do their job. So I trusted him with doing the job. Mm. Didn't need to supervise him. It's very, very important. Mm. You know, when you, when you see potential in other people, use that potential for the better of the group. We talked about this yesterday with uh, Sir Anna Shackleton. Mm. You know, it's quite important. So mm. in the end, we uh, found a, 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 a spot. Um, and uh, for me, it was important that uh, all three of us would agree that it's safe to fly the approach and the missed approach, because that was the issue. Yes. And uh, so it has to be clear. So we all three agreed, and then we uh, flew the approach, RMP approach, and landed on the opposite runway and, 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 and landed. And, and, and then uh, I waited out the thunderstorm and then continued the journey later on to Dubai. So the moral of the story is very simple, Ben. It's um, be aware of your team, the ability of your team, your surroundings, and use them to the better for the group and let them do their job. Do not interfere too much or at all. That's absolutely bang on. That's exactly what I learned from from flying with you is that you created this atmosphere of complete openness and, and trust, very relaxed. And it, it, and it, it meant that I found the very best in myself in a, a new environment on an airplane. I hadn't got much experience on. There was just never a, a question, the fact that you trusted me and, and it, it helped me to, to, to discover my potential. And I think that's really in my mind, what leadership is about is thank you. To, you want to yeah, elaborate on, the, on that uh, event? It was quite special, wasn't it? Um, yeah, talk, talk about it. Yeah, it involved involved a crash of an aeroplane. Fortunately, it wasn't nice, but yeah, go yeah. for it. <laughs> no, you, you you go. I'd be interested to hear from your side. Well, I I just remember that we we were coming in and we got radio that there had been a, a crash off the side of the runway, a local. I think it was a seven three seven. Yes. And we had to make that decision as to whether we wanted to continue into the airport or go somewhere else. And you just, yeah. you didn't even think about overruling any of us on the flight deck, the, the, the rest of the two of us. And you said, yeah. what do you think, guys? And it gave me the responsibility I was flying. Okay, well, let's crack on. Let's do it. It'll be interesting experience. And away we went. And it was, yeah, well, you tell the rest of the story. You, you have a better me long-term memory than I do, for sure. Oh, yes. No, you did really well, Ben. Um, so we were back in Jenna and received a phone call saying, uh, we have a problem. There was ops ringing from Ujung. I said, what's the problem? So there's a, a patty, which 737 crashed on the runway. Fortunately, nobody was severely injured. That's very good. Uh, however, the aircraft was wrecked on the runway. They couldn't move it. So... I remember telling them, don't worry, mate, we've got fuel for Australia. <laughs> and off we went. <laughs> Keep us updated. Uh, and uh, off we went, and we made up a plan. 
you know, and you were flying it and said, I said to you, then if you don't like it, don't fly the approach, don't land. We go to Bali. Mm. And you decided that we were comfortable. You were, you were comfortable to, to fly the approach and land the aeroplane safely, which you did really well. Um, it's not just us. There was a whole background, uh, op staff, engineering, performance engineers. Uh, since the aircraft was still on the runway, they had to create a new approach and a new safe minima, uh, safe altitude we can descend down to and then fly a missed approach without jeopardizing the safety of the aircraft. That had to be calculated. So as you mentioned a couple of days ago, Ben, uh, it's not just us. Uh, people see aviation as pilots and aircraft, maybe cabin crew and engineers, but actually there's a far bigger team involved. Air traffic control, support, even talking about yesterday, the cleaners have come on board. They're all part of the bigger team. We're all part of this big team to get the journey done safely. Completely. That's, that's something I talk a, a lot about in my previous podcast, and it, it, it's it's one of the things that was really reconfirmed when I flew with you. It's having that expansive capacity to think of every link that comes in. And I think once we, you, like me, do an awful lot of inner inner work on yourself, which we're going to talk about, you really mm. big into free diving, parting your breath for incredibly long periods of time, mindfulness, living in the moment, non judgment. But I. I put that your capacity to consider everybody and everything around down to that hard work that you put on your inside. And you came from a, a, a troubled background where you were fostered. And I think you, you fortunately had some brilliant foster parents who instilled, as we've talked about, some great qualities of humility and things like that. And I think that's why I've seen you as one of the, the, the best leaders I've, I've come across Again, it's the, it's the bucket of capacity. If Thank we you. work on ourselves inside and try and to establish our feelings, our emotions, and put some language towards it, the emotional intelligence, then we have such a greater capacity to develop our social intelligence. I call it spiritual, but it's social intelligence. We bear in mind everybody else around us. And as you say, resources, it's about using all the resources. And it's really interesting that I think people are, not working on their inner side so much, their emotional and social intelligence. And as a result, they miss so much of the resource that's available to them. And of course, in an aeroplane, we are focusing on what, what on, on this successful mission. And it really helps me to consider what, what resources are available. It's helped me learn how to develop my inner side as well. It's interesting what you're saying, Ben. It's basically, it comes down to self-awareness. Yes. Be aware of your limitations and find a solution. If you cannot crack the nut, find somebody to do it for you. And then share it rather than take it for yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's what teamwork is all about. You know, you, you work together in a, in a, in a, in a team. So hang on. I just lost the thread then. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Let's go. Awareness. This is awareness. where, it all, where it, it all starts from, isn't it? Yeah, it's self-awareness and having having uh, great role models. I think we all have role models in our lives. And I was fortunate to have uh, a great role model in my uh, foster father, Oliver. So then later on, when you move on, you meet more people and you think, oh, I like this, or you read books about about people like Ernest Shackle and Douglas Bader and so forth, um, Captain James Cook. They're all role models in my life. And you go cherry-picking. You go, I like this, I like that, I like the other, and then you form your own style. That's a very good message. So, so tell us about the values that Oliver instilled upon you as a teenage teenager, because before your double-digit years – Things yeah. are very chaotic and very uncertain for you yeah, and, that's right. and your brother. Um, so, yeah. Well, above all, Oliver was about fairness and honesty. That's very, very important. 
discipline, work ethics, finish the job before you do something pleasurable. For instance, the weekends we had to do the garden with a huge vegetable garden. All organic was great, actually. We we hated it. <laughs> we hated uh, <laughs> um, But in the end, uh, later on, uh, looking back, I, I long for a garden. I don't have a garden at the moment, but I would love to have a garden, you know, uh, to get your, your fresh food out of the garden as something special, as something really, really nice. So, yeah, uh, finish the job and, and then go and, and play football. Um, so sometimes it was tough because uh, we were members of a, of a, a football team and uh, I was goalie, for instance, goalkeeper. Hmm. And I had to make sure that I be there uh, in time to perform. Yet I had to also uh, do some gardening work in, in the morning, you know. So it's it's uh, it's it's quite good. So that that was um, Oliver. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's 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 uh, maybe. Uh, but no, there, there, there are a lot of lot of uh, positive memories I have. Uh, some of them are not so positive, but all in all, they're very very uh, positive. Um, so I said, it's uh, on top of integrity is another one, mm. quite important. I yes. think what, what I get from that is your, your, we talk about this a lot, curiosity, mm. of understanding, trying to understand from, a, from a, a very deeper holistic level what's going on and how we can take something of value out of it. So it's the, it's the, idea, uh, the idea of the creator versus the, the victim. We can live in the past or we can learn from the past, simple as that. Self-awareness is key to that. Having yes, the absolutely. language, having the language to be able to to talk about it, finding those peaceful, harmonious occasions when we give ourselves the the, the mindful time to process and give ourselves the feedback, ask for feedback, not be afraid to go and talk to people. I think there's a there's a great fear in a lot of people, particularly men, of asking for help. One of the big signs of confidence is to say, "I'm struggling here. I'm going to go and ask for help okay. because." men's value is often centered around the idea of advising and coming up with a solution. And it's a, that's a precarious position of, of avoiding, again, the resources around. So yeah, curiosity is, is a fascinating thing. Curiosity is something uh, we all probably have read Peter Pan or watched Peter Pan and Various remakes, and there, there, there was one with um, Robin uh, Robin Williams, uh, where yeah. he plays the old Pan, and uh, the moral of the story is: do not lose curiosity. Mm. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Explore. Enjoy. That's quite important. That's absolutely. So making mistakes is something that we all are inclined, I think, through through the way we're socialized and society's conditioning. We still have this problem with making mistakes. We still have this problem with failure not being acceptable, and it leads to dishonesty. Oliver instilled one of those qualities strictly in you. And if we can't admit to our mistakes and, and, and admit that we're just human like everybody else, then we yeah. become dishonest. We start telling ourselves stories. We start manipulating our own mind, finding all the evidence, confirmation bias, cognitive dissonance. It can't, this, I'm too ashamed of this. This cannot be right. So I'm going to find every reason to negate it and find something that suits staying in the comfort zone, even if, in the long term, that's definitely not a comfort zone. So we have to be bl brutally honest with ourselves and understand that feeling, that feeling, that initial feeling of all the cortisols, of the stress drug knocking around the brain is not something to shy away from, it's to learn from. 
Ben, I completely agree with you. I would go even further. The main problem is not It's the, the main problem, certainly in society, amongst men, I think globally, I've, I've flown globally, I've met many, many people, is that people are so concerned about their image. It's from a, when you are a little boy, you don't care about your image. You wake up, the sun shines, and you are happy. You cannot wait to get dressed, have breakfast. Fortunately, let's say it's a day off. You don't have to go to school and out you run. <laughs> and you go beyond these fields. There's a fantastic tree you want to climb. You climb the tree and you're really happy. And you fall out the tree. Fortunately, you are not injured and you climb up again. You're not concerned about your friends who are there with you that they will think that you are a poor climber. So you fell out the tree. No, you're not. But later on, when you walk through society, this idea that everybody is judging you, and I think it starts a school where the peer pressure kicks in, that you have to perform, you have to pass the grades. It's all about looking good, having good grades, and get recognized. You only get recognition if you perform. You don't get recognition for the person you are. But children, they just recognize you. If you perform, that's a plus. Where when you're at school, the system is geared up to put a value on you according to your performance. And you carry that through through university, or I didn't go to university, but I went to flying school, and Lufthansa was pretty, pretty tough. If you didn't pass the screening, you're on a way back. So then later on in our job, we get, as pilots, screened every six months. I just recently had knee surgery and I had a very long, long chat with the, with the doctor, the professor. He said, well, he tried to create is a, is a quality control system like we have in aviation where the doctors like pilots should go through a examination every six months. And that's pushed back by the medical profession in the States. He's now in the Middle East. Even the Middle East, they push it back. There's this, this fear of potentially making mistakes. We all make mistakes. We know that, Ben, when we fly. That's why mm. we have two of us, or sometimes three or four, sitting on the flight deck. And hopefully our colleague, a co-pilot or captain, picks it up and rectifies it. And we move on persevere you know so this fear of being judged of not performing is so big that people blend it over with a big car a trophy this a trophy that they i say a trophy wife trophy house it all comes with a price and that's all down to being afraid what people think of you. Mm. So when you do flying like us as a professional on the flight deck, away from the training system, out of the simulator, I think over the last 20 years, last two decades, the CRM has changed, the people have changed for the better. And people admit making mistakes. People don't get judged for making mistakes. And when we go on to free diving, free diving sounds dangerous, extreme. Now that's because the media pumps out to be extreme and dangerous, but they're actually very safe. Free diving is an environment where you dive holding your breath underwater on a single breath. And there is no room for errors. No. You can't make an error. 
It's you have to be brutally honest with yourself. And you also live in the moment. That's that's the positive side. But there is no such thing as ego. There is the odd person coming in. I had it actually a couple of times where I was supposed to, I call it babysitting, people with a big ego. And you know straight away who these people are. It's when you meet up in the morning. It's their mannerism. It's their talk. And you go, okay, I have to look after these guys. And normally our captain will come to you. Or another friend of mine said, could you please keep an eye on X, Y, Z? And said, okay. <laughs> and, 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 and these people endanger other people that sometimes push themselves too far. Fortunately, never happens with me. Or they end up very quickly on the boat. You know? So this is quite quite interesting. Um, uh, when we are, as I said before, we're working in an environment in a in a in a work environment where we see less and less big egos, and more and more people like you and I admitting their mistakes, being open mm. to their mistakes. We mm. don't judge anybody else for making mistakes. We, I think that's rectify them it's, 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 and, and move on. Resilience is very, very important. It's the key. Resilience is key. It's, it's grit. It's learning how to make mistakes in a confident way. I think that's something that the younger generation is struggling with a little bit now because we have an over, overly uh, safetyism from from what I understand, has gripped people to think that making mistakes is just not acceptable. But it doesn't lead to creativity and innovation. And we are protected, going back to the aeroplane, we are protected by a lot of resources, not only each other, hopefully without the ego, mm. and the open, openness and honesty and the confidence to admit mm. mistakes and the confidence to say something when something's appropriate and keep our mouth shut, not trying to prove, please perform, all the P's, which you were talking about in the free diving world, you get people coming in with the egos that are effectively trying to prove themselves valuable enough because they live in fear. In an aeroplane, we have a talk about keeping it in the greens. The reason for that yeah. is we have a monitoring system on the flight deck that tells us it's all quiet and all smooth and nice. But as soon as something is starting to go wrong, we have the amber messages come up, the flashing comes up, it gives us an indication of where the problems are. We go through a checklist to establish what, what we, if we can do something, what we can do, what the implications are. And then if it hits the red, then we need to, to really get going because there's potential serious damage of the airplane or loss of life involved in that. So it's, it's a monitoring system. It's the, self, it's the awareness. It comes back to that self-awareness thing. And talking about the, the school conditioning, I agree with that. I think I, I'm into Alfred Adler now, who is, a, who is part of the Vienna uh, psychology set with Sigmund Freud. But he talked about the fact that uh, it's, it's a winning and lo losing culture is that you, if you don't perform, then you've lost and you're not good enough. So self-consciousness starts to come in at that stage. Then it starts to accelerate when we hit the teenage years, when we need to become aware that we have to take responsibility for our community, we have to take responsibility to be the, be the protector, to be the provider. We can't hide behind our mum and dad's coattails anymore. And as a result, we get a lot more cortisol kicking in, the stress drug, to, to get us to move. We also have the oxytocin kicking in, saying you need to bond, you need to get together as a community, you need to fall in love in, in order to procreate. But it's, hmm. so you've got this mixture of neurochemicals that come in conditioning. It's not good enough if you don't perform. You might get rejected by your crew members, your teenage friends, and you might have your heart broken. And I think people are, what we need to do is encourage people to face up to their self-consciousness because that is the key. Once we break the self-consciousness, we start to look from the inside rather than the outside. We're not living according to someone else's expectations 
and getting the car just to just to get the sticking plaster for a broken bone. It's so incredibly unhealthy. And the statistics are now so much in terms of depression, anxiety, all the way down to suicide. We need to address the modern modern culture in a, in a different way. And I think the whole black box thinking idea that Matthew Saeed talks about is was what you what we've both been talking about here is is that you're actually forced to have a look at the the data the 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 actual technical data as well as our voice data and that is he talks about it the fact that that's still lacking in the in the medical world and the criminal justice system as your professor friend has has already indicated so in a way our industry requires us to be the leaders to change the way that humanity thinks about themselves I agree with you, and we are forced to do that. We are forced to do that. Um, essentially, you and I, cavemen, everybody, we, we haven't been so long ago out of the cage, we are the jungle. And our only chance of survival was to work in a team, work in a group. And you weren't outcast if you didn't kill the mammoth and only brought back a rabbit. <laughs> you still contributed. You're still a value member in society, of society. So I think what um, our job can teach is because we're confronted with, number one, we don't belong into the air. Uh, sorry, we don't belong in, in the air. Um, it's like free diving. We don't belong underwater. Mm. But we make it work. We created, that's man, created a machine that allows us to fly. So you said that quite interesting. The... Uh, you have to be flexible. The wings have to be flexible. Otherwise, they break off. They're rigid. They break off and fall out of the sky. Mm. We go up to high altitudes. We need a pressurized chamber. Otherwise, we will die. We can't breathe. We have to keep propulsion going. Otherwise, there's no lift. Fall out of the sky. So all that has to... They all was created. And you pointed out um, that we should be grateful to Leonardo da Vinci who had all these ideas and so many others creating this machine which allows us to to make the world a smaller place to connect people to do things we couldn't do 150 years ago mm. but in order to operate this machine safely in a quite hostile environment at 40 how, how, how do you fly then 45 maximum, maximum 51,000 but I've 50, only been up to 49 but yeah right round about 43 45,000 yeah. hostile environment you're protected by a man-made machine from this hostile environment so there is very little room for error think of a rapid decompression you have less than three seconds. If you don't do the right thing, you will die. So you are actually faced with real threats, real hazards, and you have to overcome them. And I call Mickey Mouse behavior, ego, posturing, lying, self-denial, has bullying has no room up there, no mm. space whatsoever, because mm. we have to perform a very serious job. We take it quite relaxed because we're used to it. Mm. But if you take a novice and say, you fly the aeroplane 51,000 feet from A to B, it will freak out if we tell them about all the threats, what can go wrong. You know, so yeah. what we learned over the years, I mean, you've been flying for over two decades as well, is 
It's okay to make a mistake. It's not an issue. Admit your mistakes and move on. It doesn't make you a lesser person. And that is the message I think it has to come down to somebody who sits in an office. If he makes a mistake, all right, that may have a financial input, but it will not necessarily kill somebody. Now, so by not being exposed to the potential threats, I understand why these people live in their cocoon, live in their show world on stage. Because of the stage, you come into work, you have the latest this, the latest that, compensate with, with material goods. Oh, yeah, I got the latest car. Look at this. I've been holiday here. Look at me. Look at there. Um, it's irrelevant, you say. Mm. So... Free diving, as I mentioned earlier, is similar. There, when you, I have friends who go down really, really deep. There is no room for error. They don't have to prove anything. They are who they are. See, so, so you and I, we had. Great, great teachers in, in Britannia, uh, former Red Arrows. Mm. Um, again, great role models. They didn't need to prove anything. Mm. They were very comfortable within their own skin, and that radiated out. Yes. Yes. That's that's vibration, the law of sympathetic resonance that I talk about. If you put two violins next to each other and yeah. you pluck the pluck the string on one, it, it it resonates on the other string. Our moods, the way we feel about ourselves, do yeah. radiate from the inside out. I think that's absolutely, absolutely that's right. Absolutely good vibrations. Right. Beach Boy song. Good vibrations. Great song, isn't it? It's a good. It's a great, great song. song. You should uh, sing it to the old folks' home. That's a very good idea. They probably recognise that because that was sixties, I think, wasn't it? I'll, yeah, I, I, will, I will take that. Good vibrations, such a good song, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it just? Yeah, I think so. It, your free diving has always fascinated me. The fact that you put yourself clearly outside the comfort zone, but you don't do it recklessly. You no. find the mentors and the instructors and the coaches to support you there. Hopefully, the ones that aren't trying to prove themselves, because it really is a life a life and death situation, but giving you such reward, not an ego boost of aren't I bloody brilliant and I'm going to go and show off to other people. And you, you told me this, the story recently of you going to, I mean, ridiculous depths. Let's talk about limitations actually, because you mentioned that you had a, uh, you had a coach who you talked to and, and she asked oh, yeah. you what your limitations right now, were yeah. and you set them. Tell us that story. Yeah. It's, it's quite, it's actually a very, very interesting story. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend a day weekend with the uh, then uh, girlfriend of the uh, world champion, uh, Alexei Miljanov, Mariana, who's also a psychologist. It's a beautiful, beautiful person. <laughs> so she asked me and others, what are your goals in freediving? And I said, well, I want to dive 50 meters deep. I want to dive 100 meters straight underwater, so two Olympic pool length. And I want to hold my breath for five minutes. Then we did the training for the whole weekend. It was really, really nice. And it involved various uh, yoga sessions and, and, and other sessions and some pool diving as well. And at the end of the session, uh, she said to me, you have no limits. I was surprised. I said, what do you mean? 
She said to me, I observed you in the water. You have no limits. You set yourself the limits in your mind. But you actually have the potential to go far beyond. And I think we do that with so much. It's going outside your comfort zone. That we are sometimes too humble or don't even are able to imagine that we can climb that as children, climb that big tree and go all the way to the top. Yeah. See, because yeah. at some stage, somebody told you, oh, you can't do that. You cannot climb the tree. It's too dangerous. No, you don't have the potential. You can't do that. And for us as mature grown-ups, we have to overcome those negative inputs and listen to yourself. And I was fortunate. I was able to listen to uh, this beautiful woman who told me, yeah, you can go on. So what I did, I actually went beyond. <laughs> mm. I haven't cracked the 50 meters yet, but that was because of a sinus issue. But I'm working on that uh, nearly every day. And uh, one day I will. That's brilliant. Imagination. Einstein said, imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. When we're a kid, what yeah. you were suggesting earlier, when we're a kid, we have such an open imagination. We're not restricted by the self-consciousness and the layers of onions of our experience that have gone wrong, the fear-based uh, yeah. issues that yeah. restrict all of us, we have a complete open imagination. And we're not governed by limiting beliefs. I call them little bastards. Little I think, bastards. Yes. Yeah, when Mar Mariana was talking, talking about that, it's we are only, we have this choice. We only choose to live by these limiting beliefs. We also have a choice to get That's rid right. of them. And I... I I'm starting to uh, coin these these ideas and fly away in a UFO, rid of the little bastards. You go for the little beauties, yeah. and then you fly away in a UFO, which stands for unlimited, fabulous opportunities. Absolutely. That was part one of my fantastic conversation with Matty on the subject of leadership and inner harmony in terms of building confidence and a, and a healthy, positive, creative mindset. As so often, I find it difficult to cut these podcasts short because the conversation is just so uh, enlivening and, and enlightening. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I look forward to seeing you on part two with Matty Woolers next week. In the meantime, I wish you all the very best and please remember to keep it in the greens. Oh.